Welcome to the Sex Ed with DB podcast, brought to you by O School. Sex Ed with DB is an intersectional, feminist, Bay Area based podcast for folks who want to hear real stories from underrepresented voices as we try to revolutionize the way we talk about sex. Just talk about sex every single day. I used to hump the shit out of everything. I think everybody does. I'm like, if you'd like me to start procreating, tough shit, because I'm not gonna. You can't have education, you can't have contraception, but you can't have an abortion. We're still on the the shit end of of the stick for a lot of medical intervention that would make our bodies function better. And now it's all queer and all messy and all bodies and really great and fantastic. Everyone gets a vibrator! I'm DB, a.k.a. Danielle Bezalow, and I'll be your host. Today's episode is all about sex and disability. We hear from Dr. Rafe Biggs and Ligia Zuniga, leaders at Sexability. Sexability is a Bay Area organization committed to empowering people with disabilities to expand sexuality and create intimate, loving relationships. Since their beginning in 2006, they have been working with individuals, groups, and organizations to transform sexuality and disability. The world can be a pretty sex-negative place. Society, religion, and culture teaches us harmful beliefs about our bodies, sex, and pleasure. And we're here to help you unlearn them one by one. In O-School's Sex Positive Oasis, you can learn from experts in moderated live streams, explore pleasure, and interact with a diverse community of sex-positive people. Ain't no shame in our sex game. Visit www.o.school to experience an interactive hashtag sexy ed session for yourself. How are you doing, Rafe? I'm doing okay. I'm doing better than I have been. So good. Great for that. Yeah. That's good. Thank you so much for taking the time to to interview with me. I'm really, really excited to chat with you about you and sexability and um, all of the things. Sure, absolutely. So we'll get started. If you could just tell us a little bit about your background and who you are, uh, how you identify, and how you got involved in the sexuality and disability space. Sure. My name is um, Rafe Eric Biggs, and I'm 48 years old, male, um, originally from the Midwest, from Indiana. I've been out in the California area for over half my life. Um, came out here originally for work and then went to graduate school and went and got a master's and PhD in organizational psychology and um, also was very interested in the body um, and interested in sexuality also just personally but not so much professionally until later but I um, had studied somatic coaching which is a modality that I still use today and looking at the whole body um, the mind the body the spirit how everything works together. And when I finished my degree at graduate school, I was working mostly in um, organizational um, settings with working with leadership, coaching, team development, that whole world. And then in 2004, I um, decided to go on an adventure that was going to change my life. Um, Also, just to kind of back up as far as how I identify, identify as straight, Um, kinky, um, open and, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's been an interesting journey. So, um, up until 2004, I had one life where I was, I was, um, had been working for a long time. I'd taken one brief trip, um, not that brief to Thailand in 2001 and really enjoyed, um, traveling and wanted to make a goal of traveling for a longer term period of time. So I went back to Thailand and visited a few other countries in that part of Southeast Asia. And then I eventually made it up on my way to India. And um, I just finished a meditation retreat up in India. And I was with some friends in their guest house at night. I noticed there was no guardrail around the the perimeter. So I picked up a candle that was set up by the edge of the roof. And the candle blinded me for a split second. And next thing I know, I'm landing on my back trying to sit up and was paralyzed from the chest down. So in that moment, my life changed completely and went from being very, you know, independent and um, 
you know, and um, active and, uh, you know, probably in the best health of my life to being, you know, in a really bad situation. And fortunately, you know, fortunately, I, you know, got good medical care. But out of that experience, um, to kind of answer the question about how I got involved in sexuality and disability, is you know, I had lots of questions when I first had got injured. A lot of them were like, I wonder if I'll ever walk again or feel anything again. I couldn't feel three quarters of my body. But also because I'd been in a relationship um, right up until that point and been in other relationships, I was still very sexually active. I just was curious about um, both pleasure as well as parenting. And there weren't many resources that the doctors could offer. Mm -hmm. And so that was really frustrating. And um, I just began to like, you know, do my own research and talk to people. And, and over the last, I guess, 14 years, there's become a lot more information out there on sexuality and disability um, for people with spinal cord injury and, and other people as well. Wow. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. That is sure. just an absolutely incredible story and how Thanks. cool that now you uh, co-run an organization um, called Sexability. Um, right. Can you talk a little bit about that and your role there? Mm -hmm. So um, Sexability came out of, like I said, kind of a personal mission of my own just to like be able to um, better empower myself and others around um, finding, making sex accessible and also finding pleasure and being able to also connect with others intimately through, you know, different kinds of relationships. So sexability is, um, so we've been around since, I think I started sexability a couple of years after my injury. So since 2006 and um, I met Leaky Andrade in about 2000, we always mix up the date. It was like around 2011, I think it was. And I was looking for someone to partner with, and it was just perfect because she is um, a woman. She's also a quadriplegic. And so there's ways in which we um, work well together just based on our dynamic. And so um, we've been teaming up together, and we've been working with a number of different organizations over the years. Um, we've done a lot of workshops for universities and um, one of our great passions right now is to work more with healthcare providers because um, there's like a limited scope in what we can do one-on-one. -on -one. There's, there's only so much capacity. And I think training other health providers, healthcare providers, to better understand the needs of people that are disabled, that have sexual desires, is very important. I mean, it's just crucially important, so. Absolutely. Um what would you say that sex, and I know it's uh, obviously a case by case and a person by person basis, but what would you say that um, sex could look like for differently abled people? And what does intimacy look like for you personally? Good question. Um, well, sex can look like so many things um, for anyone that's got a non-normative body, excuse me. It really depends on their situation. I would say it's... Um, the most important thing for me around sex is feeling connected to myself and then also connected to if I'm with a partner. So that could just be an internal sense of like, I feel, um, you know, it's also like really, really accessing what, what pleasure is like and pleasure can exist in all different parts of our bodies. We're so conditioned that it, you know, comes, primarily from our genitals, and it does, but it can come from other areas as well. Um, you know, whether it's our, all kinds of areas, our ears, our lips, um, our nipples, um, fingers, shoulders. I mean, there's so many different areas that can be erogenous. Rafe is totally right. When it comes to feeling sexual pleasure, your genitals aren't the only body parts that can get you going. There are parts all over the body sensitive to touch that can turn you on. Try experimenting with a partner and see which erogenous zones hit the spot. So, you know, when it comes to whether it's self-pleasure or pleasuring as a partner, it's really about creativity. And say so it's about the more creative we are and the more we openly communicate what our desires are. And even if we don't know exactly, but I've just found through creativity, there's like, 
so many things open up that you know never thought were even possible. And so that's been a big learning for me is is constantly um, learning about both myself and then also I, I like to talk to a lot of other people with disabilities about sex just to learn like what how do you get off you know or what what turns you on and wow that's interesting like that would work for me or maybe I want to try that so you know I think that's like having a really inquisitive mind um, is really important um, if you want to have a creative sex life and then also just um, really asking for what you want and that's something I'm still working on personally is just being really bold and you know, asking the right group, and if it's the right group of people, I, I'm sometimes surprised at what people, you know, people will come back and offer, and it's just like, wow. But oftentimes, there's, I think there's a lot of shame and um, guilt around our sexuality in general, and then you put disability on top of it, and so we feel very like, oh, I shouldn't be asking for this, or, you know, I don't know. There's all kinds of conversations that go through my head around this, um, you know, if somebody really liked me, they would approach me. I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff. But right. there's there's ways in which you need to, like, really, um, I need to, like, just, you know, just mind that and then say, okay, is this really helping me or not? Or is this, like, more, more, more static? Right. So, yeah. That makes sense? Totally. Yeah. And I think, like, that's good advice for just everybody, right, of just kind of, like, making sure you're communicating with your partner or partners or just with yourself of like, what feels good for me? How do I feel comfortable, comfortable engaging with this with a partner? And if you don't feel comfortable, like, why is that? And if you do, you know, like all power to you, because that means that you're kind of getting what you want and how you want it, which is really powerful. Right, exactly. Um, Can you talk a little bit about a transfer orgasm and sexual surrogacy? Mm-hmm. So transfer of orgasm is something that I experienced um, not too long after my injury. And give you a little background. So I have a C5-6, which is a c- cervical injury between the fifth and sixth vertebrae. I fractured my neck when I fell. And that paralyzed me from pretty much the chest down. I've got sensation like right, um, right below my nipples. On down, I, I don't have sensation, excuse me, regular sensation. I have pretty normal sensation going up. Um, I do have some feeling on my, like my thumbs, my first finger, but the rest of my fingers are fairly numb. So one of the things that I discovered when I was um, first injured is I met a woman um, and we started dating and we started you know, exploring each other's bodies and figuring out what, what feels good. And I noticed that when she was like stroking my thumb and um, or sucking on my thumb, it felt really good, like extremely good. <laughs> and um, I was like, this is really interesting. And then years before that, I'd studied Tantra. And Tantra is a practice of learning to use your breath, your intention and vibration to move erotic energy. So I knew, like, okay, let me try moving this energy through my body. So I did. And, you know, it would build. Like, it would build and build and build. And then eventually I experienced what I would call uh, a a transfer of orgasm, where it's different than, like, a genital orgasm. There was no ejaculation, but it was a release of pleasure, pleasure, a very intense release of pleasure. And I do think that it was from the stimulus of her, you know, playing with my thumb is what actually caused that transfer to happen. Um, Which is so cool that you, like, found that. Yeah, it is really really cool. And what about sexual surrogacy? So sexual surrogacy is a modality that's available. um, This is available in California and a few other states where people can explore their physical and emotional needs for intimacy. And um, they work with a therapist, and the therapist also works with a therapist. So it's typically like three people. It's the client, the therapist, and the, the surrogate. And they are licensed by the state of California. It's a little gray as far as what the legality is, but 
they can essentially they can um, you know work with someone in full capacity of helping them become sexual. So that's a that's a great offer that we have here in the Bay Area. Um, and there's other modalities similar to sexual surrogacy, such as sexological body work. And that's got a little bit more tight boundaries, but they're like really, really, really great for learning a lot about your own body and what it's you on. I feel like there are a ton of misconceptions about people with disabilities when it comes to um, sex and being sexual. Um, what would you say that you wish people knew about sexual needs and desired uh, and desires of disabled people? And what do you think is most misunderstood about the sex and disabled community? Well, I think that um, I think of people's sexual needs are typically not met very well. It's kind of it's difficult sometimes to um, find find people to, to meet our needs. And that's one of the challenges for people with disabilities run right into. Um, so there's a lot of people out there that are sexually frustrated um, and, uh, and not able to, you know, find, find, find pleasure, find, you know, and maybe even not even, they don't know how to masturbate themselves or they don't figure out how to do that. Um, or if they're being, they think it's not possible, but still being able to have, you know, have a really, good connection with yourself, I think is important. And then finding partners, um, you know, and, and there are dating sites out there, but also, you know, there's ways in which, um, you know, creating community and having people come together to support each other is, is really, really um, important, I think. Um, one, one important thing for people to know is if they're working with, um, if they're like dependent on other people to help them with their care, like other attendants or caregivers, I think it's really important to have conversations with them about um, your lifestyle and what you might need. For example, like if you are planning to masturbate, for example, and you need to talk to your attendant, like you maybe need some lube set up or some baby wipes or something, you know, something cleaned up. Um, that I think is really important because if you don't, you know, and it's like, it's just going to be a lot, whole, whole lot more conflict. So by figuring out what are the, what are the right little baby steps to do to make this transition, to make this transition happen smoothly and for them to support you. Right. Totally. Um, I would love to end this interview on, on dating and maybe your dating experiences and also just people who are differently abled or disabled um, tips that you have for our listeners who may be um, differently abled, who want to date, who want intimacy, who maybe want to use the apps. Um, what are some like tips and tools you would give them in order for them to do that? Well, there's, um, there's obviously lots of different ways to date. And um, I think, you know, online dating is a great, um, a great way to like meet people. Um, one thing I would suggest this is me personally, as I um, I disclose my, my disability um, in my profile. Um, depends, sometimes I have a picture of myself in my wheelchair, sometimes I don't, but I try to like make that up front. And I always think that's a good policy. I'd rather people know, you know a little bit more about me initially, and then they can make a decision whether they're wanting to get to know more of me. Because um, sometimes that's like a big, I've had people be like, oh, my gosh, you're so hot, blah, blah, blah. And then they find out, like, I'm disabled and don't hear from them. And that's fine. But I'd just rather get that out of the way first. <laughs> so I think that's a good a good piece of advice. Um, I also think, you know, being out in the community as much as possible and meeting people and, you know, being people face to face and, you know, getting connections and asking friends like, hey, do you have any friends that are single that you think would, you know, be interested in getting to know me? And, and just, you know, um, I would also say, like, just taking some initiative of, um, I always think, like, you know, if you see, see somebody who's attractive, let them know that they're attractive. Or let them know, give them a compliment of some sort. You know, start, start the conversation. And then, 
you know, um, see where that goes. And then I've experienced a lot of times, like, I'll just get like, oh, I don't feel very like this. There's no way this person would ever like have coffee with me or whatever. And I won't even like go there. And then other times I find myself, you know, starting a conversation and then just saying, hey, would you like to have coffee? And they're like, sure. I'm like, great. And so it, it was, <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, I thought it was going to be so hard. <laughs> so you just never you never know what's going on with the other person. And mm-hmm. I have a lot of my own self-talk about what whatever's going on. You just never know. So it's, I think it's just better to like ask and you know, they say no, they say no. And so um, I think that goes, I think you, no matter what your, 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 you know, your gender and how you approach dating, whether you're, you know, more assertive or passive or I don't know. I just think, I think having a disability does require us. There's, there's, I mean, my experience with dating is there are fewer potential partners out there that are really interested in being intimate, um, fully intimate, which is, which is a bummer, but it's a reality. Um, so I just think the more you can um, put yourself out there and, you know, if you're not feeling really confident about it, work with, um, um, you know, a, a coach or um, a surrogate partner, therapist, or somebody that can help you work through some of your stuff so you feel more more um, embodied in your own sexuality. I think it's the more we feel feel good about ourselves, that's that's where it all starts. You know, if we don't feel good about our own self-worth, then it's gonna be really hard to find someone to love us. So, Ligia, I'm so, so appreciative of you being here with us today on the podcast. Um, And if you could just start by sharing your name, uh, your background, how you identify, and how you got involved in the sexuality and disability space. Sure. Um, My name is Ligia Andrade Zuniga. I uh, have a spinal cord injury. I'm a C5-6 complete, um, which means that at the level of your C5 and C6, six vertebrae and paralyzed from that down although there's some function that is I don't know that's come back over time um, I identify as a Latina woman um, I am from the Bay Area I was born and raised in Redwood City but my parents um, immigrated from Guatemala so I've always kind of been interested in sexuality I before my injury I was on the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Coalition Board of Directors. Um, I was really interested in talking with young women about, especially women of color, about teen pregnancy, sexual health. And I worked with a um, nonprofit um, called the Redwood City Youth Health Center right out of high school. I'm a young mom. Um, I had my son when I was 17. And I um, found that dialogue within sexuality And um, just in general in my culture is very taboo. We're very Catholic saturated, I guess. People feel a lot of shame around sex and the dialogue. Um, And so that does not uh, make for very healthy, I guess, outcomes. Um, Then, you know, fast forward to my disabled life. I was interested in sexuality at that point because I didn't find any information that was pertaining to my situation because I'm a higher level, um, lower functioning quadriplegic. I found a lot of information that was geared more towards paraplegics and people with maybe more function of their bodies. Um, At that time in the hospital, I was completely impaired. So I couldn't move anything from my, my shoulders down. Um, I had to move my wheelchair with my head. I was on a ventilator. It was a very, very trying time and um, very difficult time to understand what had happened to me and why and just exploring like what life was before. And again, you know, thinking, oh, my gosh, just like a lot of people do, you know, who's going to love me? Um, Who's going to find me attractive now? How am I going to enjoy sex again? Am I going to ever be able to? to be sexual? Am I going to be desired? 
If I was thinking that way, I'm sure many other people were. So in, in my search for information, I did get some information from the hospital, but it was more around fertility and childbearing, which I was done. I had my, like I said, I already had my children and um, life was pretty much fast forwarded. So I had gone to school and had a career. And so it was like at that point in my life, I wasn't looking to have more children. Um, so the information was very, just very limited. Right. And yeah. I thought, well, like what, what can I do to educate other women? And then playing in to that whole conversation, the fact that I am a Latina. Um, again, who am I going to talk to you about this? I think my mom. She barely even could tell me about having a period. So Right, exactly. It's hard, you know, and it's uncomfortable. So uh, talking with friends and things like that, again, a lot of people really didn't give me very, um, very positive information. And people really weren't thinking about that at that, at that time, with people that I spoke to. Mm-hmm. So um, I ended up kind of exploring myself. Um, I was thinking about my body and like how, how I was going to do all of this. And before my injury, I had a pretty healthy sex life. Um, I was able to, um, have partners. Um, I was in a committed relationship after my divorce and, um, I obviously we were, we were active. So after we broke up, it was, it was like really soon be, or it was a short time before my injury um i had this period of time where i was like kind of doing my own thing and then i was injured and so it was wow i was single finally for some time trying to find myself trying to figure out who i was at that point in time because i was really i was really young i was only 28 and um it was just like a a time of confusion and then this happens right even more confused so i i did date a little bit um i went on a few dates with people able-bodied people and um people that were disabled and i was just kind of having fun i after my injury i wasn't like looking for a relationship it was just kind of like again trying to figure out who i was and because people showed interest in me either still from people that I that I knew from my past or knew people that I was meeting, it validated who I was as a human being. And so at that point, it really fulfilled the fact that everything was going to be okay, that I was still desirable, that I was still attractive, that I was still a woman. It's such a time of turmoil and like confusion and, and fear. Absolutely, um, I, yeah. The reassurance, sometimes you kind of get it where you can. Um, not to sound like a desperation, but it's it's almost, again, a validation of you, yourself as a human being. Later, almost a year later, I was in another relationship. And we became really close. He was also a public project. Um, we started living together soon after. Um, we became engaged maybe almost a year later. And he passed away. Oh, I'm and so, so sorry. After, yeah, that was it was very, very difficult. And while we had this relationship, I was able to explore again. And um, but explore in a safe place where I could be secure in what we were doing and I wasn't um I wasn't feeling like embarrassed about anything or self conscious. Um, it was just the exploration was very fluid and it was very organic um we explored asking for help because like i said he was also a public project right so he was very impaired in his function as well um but we made it work and so i finally had found a a safe place i finally found um stability Mm -hmm. Um, and then it happened again the instability so he passed away and my life changed again. Right. Um, and I went, I went right. I think that I didn't really give myself enough time 
to really think about who I was. Um, so I went back to like where that point and that point in my life that was paused in the search of who I was. And so, um, I was able, so I've always done a lot of career sport and things like that. So then I thought, well, no. So here is where my purpose is. Um, if I, I felt like this is where I can contribute to my community in an area that is completely um, repressed, that is completely um, kind of contained and um, not expressed. So I met Rafe, um, who I work with um, through sexability in uh, 2012. And that's when everything was born um, through, like with our work. Right. And can you talk, first of all, thank you so much for your your background and sharing your story. I'm so incredibly supportive of everything that you're doing to try to get information and access out there for people with disabilities, people of color, specifically women with disabilities and of color. Um, and I really, really just amazed at how you're a mother, you're, you know, a director at sexability, just like taking names and doing work, which is super impressive. Um, so that's amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about sexability and what you all do there day to day? So at sexability, we really are focused on empowering people and educating people, um, to be able to have healthy relationships. Um, and to be able to pursue relationships, to be able to nurture relationships. We provide information that is maybe sometimes a little off alternative, um, but we also really focus on self-esteem, self-image, self-acceptance, um, identity, um, everything that's around the self first, um, to be able to understand where people are like where they are in this whole conversation, um, in this experience, but then also where they want to be, um, setting goals in that sense, and then also um, where like where they came from, like what happened, um, where did you learn about sex? Where did you? What were your first conversations about this? What kind of what kind of experience have you had? Is there shame behind what you think of your body of who you are? Um, have people not taking you seriously? Do you feel like you are celebrated as a human being, that you are um, a contributing part of this world, of this society, of this, of relationships, you know? What do you want? According to the CDC, 53 million adults in the U.S. live with a disability. That's 22% of the American population. Disabled folks are often left out of the conversation when it comes to sex, dating, and exploring their bodies, which needs to change. We do one-on-one -on -one coaching. We teach webinars um, to not only not only people in our community, but health professionals, um, any type of rehab professionals, um, service providers, nonprofits, um, and then just holding community conversations. We did a training on transforming sexuality after spinal cord injury for um, people that were that did have spinal cord injuries, but also, like I was saying earlier, service professionals and health professionals. We also will do trainings and presentations at the universities, community colleges. So it's more of education and empowerment. And it's specifically for folks with different kinds of disabilities. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Obviously, because we have spinal cord injuries, that's going to be our um, forte, right? Like that's where we're going to, we're going to have the most strength. But we, that's not to say that we don't, we're not able to help other people. Right. Um, some of the people that I work with have other types of disabilities that are not spinal cord injury. So it all comes back to the same thing. People want to be loved and accepted and desired. People want to have relationships. They want to feel validated. That's constant across humanity. So what we focus on is that. Great. Um, so transitioning a little bit, I want to just say that I think a big piece of 
getting education out there about sex and disability is doing things like chatting on a podcast or having one-on-one conversations. But another big piece of it is um, what we learn in schools and in classes and in workshops and whatever education that you choose, um, whether that be like growing up and just like having the ability to chat about sex and disability in your health class in middle school, or if you're taking a course in college, right? So I'm curious, like if you were going to be teaching um, sex ed to young adults, um, what would you want them to learn about sex and disability? I want them to learn that it's okay that it's not anything shameful, that they should get the right information, that they should be able to ask questions, that they should provide the right information and embrace the whole conversation with other people. We recently trained an organization um, that worked with youth around sexuality, like the conversation with they were saying, well, how do we talk to parents, you know, about this? Because they were dealing with people who are minors. Um, and that's one thing, with, especially with the parents, like, talk with your kids. Like, don't make this something negative because then it's not conducive to a healthy life later, you know, whether it be emotional, psycho, you know, psychological stuff or physical. Wherever there's a lack of information it opens the door for problems and it opens the door for misinformation, which then just like exaggerating, but not really disease and um, abuse and um, unhealthy habits. So um, I think that's what I want people to know is that it's, it's okay that sex is a completely normal part of human life. I do kind of want to go back a little bit to this piece on on dating. Um, for folks out there who are listening, who are differently abled, disabled, whether that be a, a mental disability, um, a physical disability, um, what are some some tips that you would have? Because you've mentioned, you know, like you had an entire life prior to your accident, before you became um, injured, and then you have an entire life afterwards. And there's this been, you know, you've had definitely a lot of experience in the dating game, I would say, in both parts of your life. Um, so what what like tips would you give folks out there who are disabled, who do want to date, but don't really know where to start? Maybe they're intimidated or scared or um, like aren't really sure what the steps would be in order to, to start dating. I think anyone that starts dating should get their ans- questions answered first. Um, I think that people really should do like a inventory of themselves, of what they want out of a relationship, um, of what they're willing to do and not to do, um, what type of boundaries they want to create around this and with someone else. Communicate and reach out to organizations like Sexability if you have questions, if you need help um, with preparation or whatever it may be. Educate yourself on what's out there. Educate yourself on what type of services you can acquire. Before my fiance passed away, we asked his sister to help us be intimate. So she would set us up and help us do, you know, get in the position and then she would leave, let us explore, and then come back to help us clean up things like that. So that's something else like especially around like the um, self exploration, like masturbation and things like that. If you need help setting things up have a conversation with people you feel comfortable with or think that would be able to assist you. Um, sometimes it's really difficult because people are either nonverbal or um, there's other barriers around being able to communicate this. And so um, that would be having a conversation with someone who really cares for the best interest of that person. Um, when it comes to having people that are um, that have others that are responsible for them, that are conserved, things like that, it becomes really sticky um, because some people aren't comfortable and aren't open to this type of conversation. And they're not open to the fact that that person may have needs that um, or desires that that person isn't comfortable with themselves. So if you're not comfortable with sexuality yourself, then 
you can't possibly help someone else. And then if, again, like going back to yourself, you need to be comfortable with sex, with sexuality, with your own sexuality, with sexuality as a whole and what it means and what, um, what goes along with it, what, what's, what's all involved before you can get into a relationship some, with someone around this. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. I th- well, it's, yeah, I think your, your whole point is that it's, it's really, really complex. And like, I think like, you know, getting in touch with like your wants and needs before or while expressing them to someone else, I think is key to figuring out <clears throat> how to go about dating and intimacy in relationships. Yes, absolutely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Ligia, for being with us today. This has been an incredibly interesting and full and rich and informative interview. So thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing about um, your organization. Uh, Is there anything else that you want to speak on before um, we leave each other? Um, You know, there's a lot of really good information out there. There's a lot of really good media. Um, So videos and um, podcasts and um, literature around this. Um, there's there are a few books that um, we really that we recommend that I believe are on our website. Um, but also, if anyone needs any referrals to things like that, then please contact us. We are having a um, oh, you know what it might pass by the time this is aired. Um, recently, sexuality we have partnered with other um, educators around this topic. Um, that not only uh, represent different communities and populations around disability, but are also um, are also in the field. Um, and we created a network called the Bay Area Sexuality and Disability Network. Um, we have a Facebook page. If anybody has questions, they can um, go on our page and ask. Um, they can either ask them, um, they can post a question, or they can just message us privately. Um, but we have a vast knowledge um, from people that work in the community of people that have visual impairments to us that you know deal with a lot of different disabilities to people who have chronic pain. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of knowledge. Um, so please feel free to um, to contact us. And sexability, we're always available. We do do one-on-one coaching. Um, we have like the first session is free to just as a consultation, um, but we never turn anybody away. So if somebody can't afford um, the services, it's, you know, we'll work something out. So please feel free to contact us. Get the help you need. <laughs> Sex Ed with DB is brought to you by O School, a place to unlearn shame, explore pleasure, and interact with a diverse community of sex-positive folks through daily live streams. Forget sex ed. Our hashtag sexy ed is far more satisfying. Go to www.o.school to learn more. Our creator, host, and producer is me, Danielle Bezalo, aka DB. Our content editor is Katherine Cohen. Our graphic illustrator is Carissa Diaz. Our audio engineer is Katie McMurrin. Our social media lead is Lisa Fireman. And our fundraising coordinator is Carly Yoshida. Music by Joaquin Karud and the artist Buddha. Thank you to our featured voices and to our listeners. Tune in next time.